Welcome to Introduction to Programming. And in chapter 9, we're going to see inheritance and polymorphism. And we'll start with inheritance as a beginning. Now, inheritance is one of the key concepts in object-oriented programming. And it is allowed because we have already defined the concept of class. Now, a way, um, what, uh, the way we can see a class is that we have a new type, which can collect different types of variables that uh, consist out of data members and or attributes and as well a set of related operations so functions that you use to deal with those variables which we call methods or member functions and those two define the interface to objects of that class so once we have a class defined where we say what a class really makes and what um, how these functions for instance are implemented we have the interface so that we can make objects of this particular class. Now, an object is an instance of a class. That's already something that we've seen. Now, we've not seen yet the fact that if you create many and many classes, you might in certain applications see that some of those classes become quite similar. For instance, in our example, we had a cat and we've done loads of things to this cat class. Um, maybe a little bit later we would have exactly the same for a dog and that if you look at the attributes or the data members that those two classes might have and the methods you would see a lot of duplication there and for some that duplication is okay because cats and dogs speak differently um, or they might have something that is different but it would make sense to have something that is common to both cats and dogs now, the reason why these two classes are so similar is because both of them are animals, or even more specific, mammals. And all these things that we could contribute, or that are very similar between the two, are things that we could actually create a different type of class for called mammal. And this is exactly the, the core concept of inheritance. So we might have a class called mammal, and there we might implement everything that has to do with age or weight of a mammal, the fact that a mammal speak and eat. And then after that, we could derive from this base class several other classes like a cat and a dog with their own specific functions or data members. In this case, a cat could, for instance, do exactly the same what a mammal can do, except that it also can purr. Or a dog can do exactly the same what a mammal can do, but it also has this extra information, it's breeds, and it can also wag its tail. So this is just in addition to whatever a mammal can do. And in that case, we say that cats and dogs can be derived from mammals. They inherit everything that a mammal can do and add something on. And this goes uh, on multiple levels. So once you have a mammal, you can also say that a mammal inherits several things from an animal. And this can go on and on. So basically, you can have loads of different animals, different living creatures, different objects even, uh, where you uh, inherit things from a base class. And since you can do this on many levels, um, an infinite amount of levels really, um, we talk here about hierarchy. And hierarchy. So a hierarchy basically means that a cat can inherit from a mammal, a mammal can inherit from an animal, and this could go on and on. Now, this means that you have different types of relations between classes. Classes can be a parent class from a child class or the other way around. In that case, we also look at different uh, language that we use there. So a mammal inherits from an animal or a dog inherits from a mammal, whereas a dog is a mammal and a mammal is an animal. Or an animal is a direct base class or a super class of a mammal. Or animal and mammal are base classes or super classes of the class dog. Or mammal is a derived class or a subclass of animal. And dog and mammal are derived classes or subclasses of animal. So that's the type of language we'll use from now on when we talk about inheritance between different types of classes that we can define. Now, this allows us to do some conceptual modeling. We can define a hierarchy of classes that represent the concept of data. And often, that this is the case, data is often very hierarchical in structure. 
and we can specialize or generalize. You know, generalize uh, between cats and dogs to a mammal or specialize from a mammal to a cat or a dog. And this, of course, allows us to reuse code. Instead of having to program a different class for each animal that we could possibly use in our program, we can just uh, go for commonalities and call that, for instance, mammal or animal. And then we just have to program those classes like dog and, cl and cats that inherit most of the functionality functions or data members uh, from the mammal class or the animal class. So let's see a look at, or let's look at a, at a different example now where we use the mammal class and there solve most of the things we have solved before in for instance a cat class. So in that case our mammal has a constructor, it has uh, uh, something to set and get the age, also the weight, um, and it can speak. This is what, what is publicly available. Now what is different for our base class um, is that, or the class that we will inherit from later, is that we won't have a, a, a public and a private, but we have a public and protected data members. Um, in this case, we have two protected data members, which are its age and its weight. Now remember that for the cat class, we use these two data members as private data members. Here they are protected, which means that if we uh, derive from our class mammal, we can still access these two. That means if we derive a dog, or a cat class from the mammal class later, we can from a dog class and a cat class still access these two data members only because they are protected. If they were private, we would not be able to do so. So this is basically an overview of the three keywords that we can have for a class. We have private, those are the members that can only be accessed within that class functions. So whenever we define a function, within a class, that one can access the private data members, but no other function outside that class. For protected, we also widen the scope to all the functions of classes that get derived from this class. And for public, basically anybody can access those members, function members or data members. So let's now use a cat class that derives the functional from the functionality of mammal. So we say here in that case, in terms of definition, that we have a cat uh, cat class, and this we inherit for and we inherit publicly from mammal. So this means only by adding this that cat suddenly gets all the things that mammal has, and we can add a little bit of that to ourselves. We have our own constructor, we have our own uh, destructor and we have our per function, which doesn't change any of the data variables or data members that we have inside our cat class. Now, the fact that we put public here means that the public members of the base class are also public for the derived class. And this is the, the typical example we're going to use from now on. So there are private and, um, and protected uh, ways of inheriting, but we're not going to see that in this lecture. So let's now also add a dog class. So a cat class, as we've seen over here, can only, can only have a constructor, destructor, and it can have an additional um, function called per. Whereas a dog class over here will have a breed as an extra data member, which is protected again, which means if we derive from dog later on, we will be able to also access this, this data from those classes. So its breed is coming at and attached to all the other things that we already have from animal. And as uh, public data members go, we have our constructor. We have a constructor with uh, the breed as well. We have a destructor and we have the functions to get the breed of this dog and to wag our tail or the dog's tail. So this is the new functionality for our dog. Everything else, getting the age, setting the age, and all those other things that a mammal already provides, we automatically get here for free because we derive the dog from a mammal class. Now, what, let's see what we can all get. So, what we inherited from mammal is uh, the getAge function, the setAge function, 
the get weight and the set weight functions, as well as the speak, because every mammal can do those three, uh, those five things, or can uh, have access to those five um, function members. Now, a dog itself has a constructor, a constructor with the breeds, a destructor, and two functions: one to get the breeds, and one to wag the tail. Now, remember, or what is important to say here is that the constructor and destructor of mammal are not inherited. There. So, from our dog, um, we basically have the following data members. So, we've seen the function in the previous slide. Here, we see the data members. From mammal, we have an integer for the age, an integer for the weight of the mammal. So, those are inherited by our dog. And for our dog itself, we also have attached to that the breeds. Now, the only thing we need to answer now is what happens with constructors and, dest and destructors. That can be a little bit tricky. Now, when a dog is created, then automatically the mammal constructor is called. And that initializes all the data members that are inherited from mammal. So age and weight in this case. And only after that, the dog constructor is called. And that then initializes the data members that are added by the dog. And when a dog is deleted, so for instance, when a dog was created in a function and that, create, that function returns, this dog is then deleted. And what happens then is that the dog destructor is called first, and then only then the mammal destructor. So you have, it's a bit like uh, peeling an onion, so you have different layers. Um, creating one uh, means you go from inside to the outside and uh, deleting one is you go from the outside to the inside of the onion. So when you pass arguments between or for the constructors, this can sometimes uh, be a little bit tricky. So assume we have the only the following constructors for our mammal class. We have the default constructor with no parameters and we have a constructor that we made ourselves with just one parameter, namely the age of the mammal. And we don't have a constructor where we can immediately provide the weight. But do remember that we do have functions that to set and get the weight as well inside the mammal class. Now we want to have the following ones for the dog. We want to have three types of constructors. The default constructor, then we have the constructor where we provide the age and then the breed. And then we have another constructor where we can define first the, or set the first age, then initialize the weight, and then the breed. Now, how do we do this? This is not that trivial. And this is basically the way we can do this. Um, first, the mammal constructors could be uh, quite straightforwardly implemented like this. This is something we've seen in chapter 8 already. So we can basically, even before we uh, deliver the statements over here for the constructor, immediately initialize its age to 1 and we initialize its weight to 5. We could also assign this because both of them are not constant. Um, and we can do this also for the second constructor where we provide the age parameter and pass this age parameter. Right, now what we do for the dog is then completely different in all three cases. That's why we have this example. Now for the default constructor, we could for instance uh, initialize the breed to Yorkie and immediately uh, pass, um, do this initialization straight before we even implement this constructor. We could also explicitly say that this is um, then calling the default constructor of mammal, but this is also something that we can leave away with because this is done anyway. So that is the straightforward case. Now, if we provide parameters in a constructor, there are a few cases that are slightly different. Now, for the first one, when we provide the age, remember age is a data member of, of the class mammal, not from dog. So what we'll have to do then is, in that case, call uh, in the initialization the constructor of mammal, which provides age as its sole parameter. And for breed, breed is a part of dog, so in this case, we can initialize its breed by breed. And these two things uh, we can already do before we define anything to be happening within the base, uh, within the uh, definition or the implementation of this constructor over here. Now, for the final constructor, it gets a little bit more complicated 
Now we have our age. For our age, we have just as here the fact that we can uh, call a particular constructor, name, namely mammal, with a, uh, uh, with, a fur, with one parameter age as its parameter. So this constructor we're going to call with this particular parameter. Now the problem is that that's the only one that is available that is not the default constructor for mammal. So when we have our weight, which is also a data member of class mammal, we can't do this here anymore. And we can't also do it like with its breed breeds because we don't really have um, uh, access to the, its weight and weight uh, for the class dog. So this will result in a compiler error. So what we have to do for weight is actually assign it, as we've done uh, before chapter 8, uh, we have to set its weight. This is something that can be accessed um, because dog, uh, because first of all, its weight is in mammal, uh, in the protected parts of mammal, and this is then inherited um, uh, by dog. So dog can access its weight and can assign uh, weight, which is this parameter over here, to its weight. It can't initialize it, however, here. And then finally we have breed, which is part of dog, that we can, as before, um, initialize over here. So those uh, are the different ways we can uh, deal with constructors and initializing particular data members between different levels in the uh, inheritance.